Lesson 6 More Lessons from the Master Teacher Sabbath Afternoon October 31 Jesus looked for a moment upon the scene, the trembling victim in her shame, the hard-faced dignitaries devoid of even human pity. His spirit of stainless purity shrank from the spectacle. Well he knew for what purpose this case had been brought to him. He read the heart and knew the character and life history of everyone in his presence. These would-be guardians of justice had themselves led their victim into sin that they might lay a snare for Jesus. Giving no sign that he had heard their question, he stooped and, fixing his eyes upon the ground, began to write in the dust. Impatient at his delay and apparent indifference, the accusers drew nearer, urging the matter upon his attention. But as their eyes following those of Jesus fell upon the pavement at his feet, their countenances changed. There, traced before them, were the guilty secrets of their own lives. The people, looking on, saw the sudden change of expression and pressed forward to discover what it was that they were regarding with such astonishment and shame. Their robe of pretended holiness torn from them, they stood, guilty and condemned, in the presence of infinite purity. They trembled lest the hidden iniquity of their lives should be laid open to the multitude, and one by one, with bowed heads and downcast eyes, they stole away, leaving their victim with the pitying Savior. The Desire of Ages, page 461 You believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But do you have a personal faith in regard to your own salvation? Do you believe that Jesus is your Savior? That He died on Calvary's cross to redeem you? That He has offered you the gift of everlasting life if you believe on Him? And what is it to believe? It is to fully accept that Jesus Christ died as our sacrifice, that He became the curse for us, took our sins upon Himself, and imputed unto us His own righteousness. Therefore we claim this righteousness of Christ, we believe it, and it is our righteousness. He is our Savior. He saves us because He said He would. Faith and Works, page 70 It is in accordance with the divine plan that we follow every ray of light given of God. Man can accomplish nothing without God, and God has arranged His plans so as to accomplish nothing in the restoration of the human race without the cooperation of the human with the divine. The part man is required to sustain is immeasurably small, yet in the plan of God it is just that part that is needed to make the work a success. The great change that is seen in the life of a sinner after conversion is not brought about by any human goodness. He who is rich in mercy has imparted his grace to us. Then let praise and thanksgiving ascend to him because he has become our Savior. Let his love, filling our hearts and minds, flow forth from our lives in rich currents of grace. God's Amazing Grace, page 319. Sunday, November 1, instead of hiding. The Lord visited Adam and Eve and made known to them the consequence of their disobedience. As they heard God's majestic approach, they sought to hide themselves from His inspection, whom they delighted, while in their innocence and holiness, to meet. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? This question was asked by the Lord not because he needed information, but for the conviction of the guilty pair. How didst thou become ashamed and fearful? The Story of Redemption, page 39 The Lord beheld Adam and Eve as they took of the forbidden tree. In their guilt they fled from his presence and hid themselves, but God saw them. They could not cover their shame from his eyes. When Cain slew his brother, he thought to hide his crime by denial of his deed. But the Lord said, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Genesis chapter 4 verse 10 
The Bible presents the law of God as a perfect standard by which to shape the life and character. The only perfect example of obedience to its precepts is found in the Son of God, the Savior of lost mankind. There is no stain of unrighteousness upon Him, and we are bidden to follow in His steps. That I May Know Him, page 359. As the ransomed ones are welcomed to the city of God, there rings out upon the air an exultant cry of adoration. The two Adams are about to meet. The Son of God is standing with outstretched arms to receive the Father of our race, the being whom He created, who sinned against His Maker, and for whose sin the marks of the crucifixion are borne upon the Savior's form. As Adam discerns the prince of the cruel nails, he does not fall upon the bosom of his Lord, but in humiliation casts himself at his feet, crying, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain! Tenderly, the Savior lifts him up and bids him look once more upon the Eden home from which he has so long been exiled. After his expulsion from Eden, Adam's life on earth was filled with sorrow. Every dying leaf, every victim of sacrifice, every blight upon the fair face of nature, every stain upon man's purity was a fresh reminder of his sin. Terrible was the agony of remorse as he beheld iniquity abounding and in answer to his warnings met the reproaches cast upon himself as the cause of sin. With patient humility he bore, for nearly a thousand years, the penalty of transgression. Faithfully did he repent of his sin and trust in the merits of the promised Savior, and he died in the hope of a resurrection. The Son of God redeemed man's failure and fall, and now, through the work of the Atonement, Adam is reinstated in his first dominion. The Great Controversy, pages 647 and 648. Monday, November 2. On the Run. Jacob was afflicted because he had made a mistake in his life. He was cast down to the very depths. Alone, weary, dispirited, tortured by the recollections of his past errors and overwhelmed with apprehensions for the future, he laid him down to rest, his head pillowed upon a stone. Had Jacob's conscience been clear, his heart would have been strong in God. But he knew his present perplexities, his fears and trials, were in consequence of his sins. This reflection is what embittered his life. Jacob was repentant, yet he did not feel easy under the wrong he had done. Through tribulation and through physical and mental suffering, he could only have hoped to find his way again to the favor of God. Oh, the wonderful condescension of God! He is ever ready to meet us, even in our infirmities, and to encourage us by His presence when we have done all on our part to make an entire surrender to Him. Heaven is open to man. God will be entreated to do these things for us. The future may seem dark before you, but God lives. This Day with God, page 323. Jacob knows now that it is the angel of the covenant with whom he has been in conflict. Though disabled and suffering the keenest pain, he does not relinquish his purpose. Long has he endured perplexity, remorse, and trouble for his sin. Now he must have the assurance that it is pardoned. The divine visitant seems about to depart, but Jacob clings to him, pleading for a blessing. The angel urges, Let me go, for the day breaketh. But the patriarch exclaims, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. What confidence, what firmness and perseverance are here displayed! Had this been a boastful, presumptuous claim, Jacob would have been instantly destroyed. But his was the assurance of one who confesses his weakness and unworthiness, yet trusts the mercy of a covenant-keeping God. Through humiliation, repentance, and self-surrender, this sinful, erring mortal prevailed with the majesty of heaven. 
He had fastened his trembling grasp upon the promises of God, and the heart of infinite love could not turn away the sinner's plea. As an evidence of his triumph and an encouragement to others to imitate his example, his name was changed from one which was a reminder of his sin to one that commemorated his victory. The Great Controversy, page 617. When the enemy tells you that the Lord has forsaken you, tell him that you know he has not, for he declares, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Dismiss the enemy. Tell him you will not dishonor the Lord by doubting his love. There is no limit to the help that the Savior is willing to bestow on us. Trust him all the time. Take hold of the riches of his grace, saying, I will believe. I do believe that Jesus died for me. The way before you may seem dark, but Jesus can make it light. In Heavenly Places, page 275. Tuesday, November 3 Rabbi Jesus By sin man was shut out from God, except for the plan of redemption, eternal separation from God, the darkness of unending night, would have been his. Through the Savior's sacrifice, communion with God is again made possible. We may not in person approach into his presence, in our sin, we may not look upon his face, but we can behold him and commune with him in Jesus, the Savior. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. God is in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and chapter 5, verse 19. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John chapter 1 verse 14, Revised Version, and chapter 1 verse 4. The life and the death of Christ, the price of our redemption, are not only to us the promise and pledge of life, not only the means of opening again to us the treasures of wisdom, they are a broader, higher revelation of his character than even the holy ones of Eden knew. Education page 28. We come to God by special invitation, and he waits to welcome us to his audience chamber. The first disciples who followed Jesus were not satisfied with a hurried conversation with him by the way. They said, Rabbi, where dwellest thou? They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. John chapter 1 verses 38 and 39 so we may be admitted into closest intimacy and communion with God. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91 verse 1 Let those who desire the blessing of God knock and wait at the door of mercy with firm assurance, saying, For thou, O Lord, hast said, Every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 131. God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought can reach. The living God has given in his holy law a transcript of his character. The greatest teacher the world has ever known is Jesus Christ. The ideal of Christian character is Christ-likeness. There is open before us a path of continual advancement. We have an object to reach, a standard to gain which includes everything good and pure and noble and elevated. There should be continual striving and constant progress onward and upward toward perfection of character. In Heavenly Places, page 141. Jesus has helped the whole world to an intelligent knowledge of his divine mission and work. He came to represent the character of the Father to our world, and as we study the life, the words, and works of Jesus Christ, we are helped in every way in the education of obedience to God.
and as we copy the example he has given us, we are living epistles known and read of all men. We are the living human agencies to represent in character Jesus Christ to the world. Lift Him Up, page 169. Wednesday, November 4. A Woman Talks Back Behold, a Canaanitish woman came out from those borders and cried, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Matthew chapter 15, verse 22, Revised Version Christ knew this woman's situation. He knew that she was longing to see him, and he placed himself in her path. By ministering to her sorrow, he could give a living representation of the lesson he designed to teach. For this he had brought his disciples into this region. He desired them to see the ignorance existing in cities and villages close to the land of Israel. The people who had been given every opportunity to understand the truth were without a knowledge of the needs of those around them. No effort was made to help souls in darkness. The partition wall which Jewish pride had erected shut even the disciples from sympathy with the heathen world. But these barriers were to be broken down. Christ did not immediately reply to the woman's request. He received this representative of a despised race as the Jews would have done. In this he designed that his disciples should be impressed with the cold and heartless manner in which the Jews would treat such a case as evidenced by his reception of the woman, and the compassionate manner in which he would have them deal with such distress as manifested by his subsequent granting of her petition. The Desire of Ages, pages 399 and 400. Jesus knows the burden of every mother's heart. He who had a mother that struggled with poverty and privation sympathizes with every mother in her labors. He who made a long journey in order to relieve the anxious heart of a Canaanite woman will do as much for the mothers of today. He who gave back to the widow of Nain her only son and in his agony upon the cross remembered his own mother is touched today by the mother's sorrow. In every grief and every need, he will comfort and help. Let mothers come to Jesus with their perplexities. They will find grace sufficient to aid them in the care of their children. The gates are open for every mother who would lay her burdens at the Savior's feet. He who said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, Mark chapter 10 verse 14, still invites mothers to bring their little ones to be blessed by him. The Ministry of Healing, page 42. Fathers and mothers should look upon their children as younger members of the Lord's family committed to them to educate for heaven. The lessons that we ourselves learn from Christ we should give to our children as the young minds can receive them, little by little, opening to them the beauty of the principles of heaven. Thus the Christian home becomes a school where the parents serve as under-teachers while Christ himself is the chief instructor. The Desire of Ages, page 515. Thursday, November 5. A student who gets it. Throngs of people who possess their sight are passing to and fro, but they have no desire to see Jesus. One look of faith would touch his heart of love and bring them the blessings of his grace. But they know not the sickness and poverty of their souls, and they feel no need of Christ. Not so with the poor blind man. His only hope is in Jesus. As he waits and watches, he hears the tread of many feet, and he eagerly inquires, What means this noise of travel? The bystanders answer, That Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. With the eagerness of intense desire, he cries, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. They try to silence him, but he cries the more vehemently, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. This appeal is heard. His persevering faith is rewarded. Not only is physical sight restored, but the eyes of his understanding are opened. In Christ he sees his Redeemer, and the Son of Righteousness shines into his soul. 
all who feel their need of Christ as did blind Bartimaeus, and who will be as earnest and determined as he was, will, like him, receive the blessing which they crave. Sons and Daughters of God, page 126. We are not always to remain children in our knowledge and experience in spiritual things. We are not always to express ourselves in the language of one who has just received Christ. But our prayers and exhortations are to grow in intelligence as we advance in experience in the truth. God has given us many advantages and opportunities, and when the last great day shall be ushered in, and we shall see what we might have attained had we taken advantage of the helps that heaven vouchsafed to us, when we see how we might have grown in grace and look upon these things as God looks upon them, seeing what we have lost by failing to grow up into the full stature of men and women in Christ, we shall wish that we had been more in earnest. God does not desire you to remain novices. He needs in His work everything that you can gain here in the lines of mental culture and clear discernment. He desires to have you reach the very highest round of the ladder and then step off it into the kingdom of God. Sons and Daughters of God, page 330. Many souls are hungering for the bread of life. Their cry is, Give me bread. Do not give me a stone. It is bread that I want. Feed these perishing, starving souls. Let us bear in mind that the strongest meat is not to be given to babes who know not the first principles of the truth as we believe it. In every age the Lord has had a special message for the people of that time. So we have a message for the people in this age. But while we have many things to say, we may be compelled to withhold some of them for a time, because the people are not prepared to receive them now. The Voice in Speech and Song, pages 327 and 328. For further reading, The Desire of Ages, The Sermon on the Mount, pages 298 to 314, and Steps to Christ, The Test of Discipleship, pages 57 to 65.